Jeg kan spørge lige her op med jer, op med Lord Prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for your love to us and for the salvation you've provided for us in Christ, for all that you do for us and the way that you've guided us. And we ask that you would bless the message tonight, Lord, and that you would reveal your truth to it. We know that sometimes that the, the truth is hard to accept and can be cutting, but we know that you furnish comfort, so we ask that you would bless her tonight. And also after the meeting is over, we ask for your for your love to be with us as we discuss discuss with others that we might be respectful and treat others as you would handle. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now tonight we're going to have Wesley P. Walter speak to us again. And tonight he'll, the subject will be on the revival in Palmyra, New York. And uh, as I brought out last night, Wesley Walters is a pastor of the Presbyterian Church in Marissa, Illinois. And he's a Bible scholar and he's very interested in archaeology, the Hebrew language, things like that. But he's also did a number of books on Mormonism. And I have here three of the pamphlets. We have these for sale with the print that Wesley Walters has written. Uh, the one here, Joe Smith Bainbridge, New York Court Trials, covers the subject he went over last night about the 1826 trial of Joseph Smith. And then he has one, Joseph Smith among the Egyptians, where he goes into the papyri that were given to the church that are, yeah, it's translated as the Book of Abraham and shows there's uh, no basis uh, for the Book of Abraham from the papyri. And then this last one, uh, New Light on Mormon Origins from the Palmyra, New York Revival, is of course the subject he's going to address us on tonight. And this little booklet was uh, published, and after that, uh, they asked uh, Wesley Walters to write an article in Dialogue, the Journal of Mormon Thought. And uh, I have a copy here, I don't have it for sale, but it's a spring 1969 issue, and they allowed him a great deal of space to write in there, and then it had a uh, rebuttal to his work. But that didn't end up there. Then the BYU study also came out with an issue, and I think it was primarily inspired by the, the work uh, that Walters had done. They brought out this issue, uh, and they had a lot of interesting material in it. But there was one thing that, that really interested me here, was the article by James B. Allen and Leonard J. Arrington. As you may know, since that time, Leonard J. Arrington has become the church historian. And they have a statement over here that shows me that they weren't able to really refute Walter's work. <clears throat> it says the issue for, also I believe for spring of 1969, BYU studies, and on page 272, they say, what evidence do we have, other than the work of Joseph Smith, that there was an unusual excitement on the subject of religion in the vicinity of Palmyra in 1820s? Up to this point, little such evidence has been uncovered and Walters challenged the story in the article referred to above. Also in the same issue, Milton Bachman uh, had an article, and later he expanded it into a book, Joseph Smith's First Vision. And uh, in this work, although it's obvious that Walters research was the thing that inspired this work also, uh, there's no mention of Walters. And I have a uh, two pages out of Courage magazine, an article by William T. Russell, and he, he mentions this, I wanted to read it here tonight. He says, for at least the last of the past seven years, there has been an awareness among Mormon historians of problems with a traditional account of Joseph Smith's first vision. And he goes on, he says, Reverend Walters significantly called into question the dating of the first vision in 1820 by noting evidence that there was no revival in Palmyra in 1820, and that in fact the revival referred to was in the fall of 1824. Further, the Reverend Lane was ministering in Palmyra in 1824, but not in 1820. All in all, Walters presented a good case for the latter day, for the revival which stirred Smith's interest in religion. Now he goes on further, he says, when the doubts that the Allen and Walters articles raised about the official story of the first vision 
are not convincingly answered in Bagman's book. He has simply marshaled evidence that might support the official story and ignored evidence to the contrary. Bagman has told this reviewer that he wrote to counter the article by Walters, yet he doesn't mention the Walters article because he prefers not to draw attention to it. Now, I think it's a pretty weak case when somebody presents an argument like that and you will not call attention to it or even mention it. Now, uh, a couple of other things I wanted to mention uh, tonight is that we have an offering box in the bank. We have an expense for renting the building and then mostly for advertising for the newspaper and uh, radio and uh, running around $350 for these lectures and we received some money in last night and we would appreciate it if anybody that wants to help uh, uh, could help us on that. And also we have some free literature out there that would like you all to have copies of. And uh, one piece relates, uh, really relates to the work that Walters will speak to us about tonight. It's on the first vision. It's uh, what we know as Joseph Smith's strange account of the first vision. It's uh, in his own handwriting. We have a photograph of it there. It's the only account that's in his own handwriting, and it's the earliest document, about 1832, six years before the official version was written. And this account only mentions one, per one personage is appearing to Joseph Smith, rather than the father and son. And also there we have, uh, we have a photograph of uh, the trial doc document that Walters mentioned last night. We have that as free literature, so you're welcome to come and pick that up after the meeting. I'll turn the time over to Wesley D. Walters now. Thank you very much, and it's a joy to be with you again this evening. And I hope you uh, recognize, if you weren't here last night, that I don't receive anything for this lecture. And uh, you know, these people went out on the limb to get me here, and uh, most of the expense is just really for the rental of the auditorium and the advertisement. So I hope you will remember that uh, offering box. I don't think the way the offering has been going that we're going to run over at all. If anything, we're going to come behind. Uh, but if we should go over, why well, we will see that if the, any extra funds go to uh, a charitable work that uh, tries to give sight to blind people. And let me say before I start tonight's uh, lecture uh, a couple of notes about the last night. Someone pointed out, I forgot to mention where the bills were today. They were returned to the county and the county board of supervisors turned them over to Mrs. May Smith who lives in Norwich, New York. She has them in her own home, farmhouse. Uh, she is uh, the county historian. It's an honorific title only, a non-paying job which anybody can campaign for that has an interest in local history. And uh, as she has been so far reluctant to show them to anybody, someone told me uh, that she uh, was going to try to clean the bills herself. One of the things you could do with old documents is wash them. Well, if she washed those, I'm sure half of them fell apart. So I don't know, maybe that's why she's reluctant to show them to anyone, but uh, they, that's where they, they are. I checked a few months ago and she still claimed to have them. And secondly, um, the items I had out there, uh, which were kind of documents behind what I said, and uh, the batch that I have here this evening, essentially about four dollars worth of Xeroxing, and I pulled out of my notes and brought along with me. I made a copy while I was out here and put it in the church historian's office, and I made a second copy that I'm going to leave uh, with the tanners, so that uh, you might say there's something on the opposite side of the fence, and uh, whichever you're most friendly with or have the best access to, you're welcome to go there and look at them. There is no uh, copyrighted material. The only thing that has stamped on it, not for reproduction, is the material from the Presbyterian Historical Society. And that, by that they meant they didn't want it printed up in book form without their permission. But certainly if you want to borrow the, the file and, and take it up to Salt Lake and out for graphics or someplace and copy it, I'm sure the tanners would be glad to loan it to you as long as they got their copies back. But you'll certainly be free to look at it there. Another question that was asked was, uh, do I believe that they really were gold plates there? I didn't mean to convey that impression at all last night. I may have in my haste to try to get within a reasonable time limit. Um, I think the uh, method that Smith uh, said he was translating the gold plates by, namely by putting a stone in the hat and reading it off, was simply a PR piece, that is a public relations piece, 
Uh, when you look seriously at the Book of Mormon and find that there are 14 chapters of Isaiah quoted with the italics carefully left out or changed at the points where they have italics, he would either have to have memorized the entire 14 chapters or else had his Bible open, and most scholars now are concluding he had his Bible open. But he couldn't very well have his Bible open and have his head in the hat at the same time. So uh, I think the way he really did the book and the way he pre uh, put forth to the public that he did, did the book are really two different things, but I don't believe he had any gold plates. And then finally, uh, someone wondered why and there was no response uh, in 1886 right here in Salt Lake by either the Mormon press and no further mention in any other publication when the original document, which is now lost, the trial document, uh, was published in the Utah Christian Advocate. And I think the answer is you have to understand that they were in the midst of a very, very hot issue at the time. In November and December, uh, what is sometimes uh, uh, known as the prostitution conspiracy was upon the city. The Mormon-dominated police department had opened houses of prostitution uh, with the attempt to uh, entrap uh, the non-Mormon officials. The governor was valued at $500 to a prostitute if she could seduce him. There were little peepholes cut in the back of the room, and they did manage to capture the state uh, United States Marshal, who the day before had arrested a polygamist, and the next day was found at the house of prostitution. Well, of course, this is entrapment and is illegal. And uh, just at that time in November and December, there was a, a red-hot issue in the courts, and it slopped over into January the next year. And I think if uh, the editor of the Utah Christian Advocate had published it on a slow news day, it might have uh, really made headlines. But in the midst of that situation, there was no way that anybody was going to pay any attention to a little dead old document from New York when everybody was ready to practically shoot each other on the street. And I think that's the reason that uh, there was no further mention of the subject either by the Mormons or the non-Mormons. They were preoccupied with bigger issues than that, that matter of life and death for both sides. Uh, I believe Gerald is going to touch a little bit in the forthcoming book in a, just a small way on this prostitution conspiracy. And so if you don't know anything about it, uh, I think you'll have a little material. And the Desert News incidentally defended it and said they were perfectly right in doing this, which makes an interesting uh, item for uh, Mormon scholars to uh, uh, have an apologetic defense on. Well, let's get then into the matter of the, um, of the first vision and problems with the first vision. Uh, we could reiterate a number, a number of statements here this evening. Uh, some of the general authorities, the president of the church, have all pointed out how foundational the first vision story is uh, to the Mormon church. Uh, you can hardly be in Utah and not know it, and yet at the risk of uh, feeling that perhaps there may be one that doesn't, uh, let me just read you a little bit uh, that uh, is at the heart of the matter. Uh, Joseph Smith's story, as he told it, and this is the foundation of the church, according to Robert Simpson, according to President Smith. Sometime in the second year after our removal to Manchester, there was, in the place where we lived, an unusual excitement on the subject of religion. It commenced with the Methodists, but soon became general among all the sects in that whole uh, region of country. Indeed, the whole district of country seemed affected by it, and great multitudes united themselves to the different religious parties, which created no small stir and division amongst them, the people, some crying low here and others low there. Some were contending for the Methodist faith, some for the Presbyterian, and some for the Baptist. And so he says this was in his 15th year, that is, he was about 14 years old, and he was stirred up by these meetings and it led to uh, consider and ponder which of all the churches was correct. And uh, went out into the woods to pray, taking James, if any man lack uh, wisdom, let him ask for God. Taking that as his text, he uh, knelt down and uh, first thing you know, I had a marvelous vision of uh, a light from heaven resting upon him and he saw two personages whose brightness and glory defy all description, standing above me in the air. One of them spoke to me, calling me my name, and pointing to the other said, This is my beloved son, hear him. Now that is the uh, story that one missionary tell over and over again. It's a story you'll find in the uh, told in the uh, visitor center, and practically every Mormon, I think, could almost recite it by heart. In 1960, I read an article, as I guess it's sort of an amateurish thing, um, in uh, Christianity Today. Uh, it was a very, very compressed article, and Carl Henry asked me to write it. Uh, he told us uh, 
the ones that were writing articles at that time, that we had in 1800 words to cover the history of the church, uh, the new developments, its doctrine, and a critique. And that is essentially six double-spaced type pages. Well, you could write that much just on the history of the church. So I wrote in a very compressed style. In fact, as I go back and read it, I wonder any, if any of the readers understood what I said. It was so compressed. And uh, for that reason, it did leave something to be desired. And I had one Mormon uh, write to me, young fellow, and when I had made a statement about the first vision story showing signs of having been altered and reconstructed, uh, he said, in effect, uh, you certainly don't mean the text of this, this uh, roller brief case was changed. Well, that was one of the things I really did mean, that the text was changed. Uh, the Pearl Great Price, uh, when it uh, was first printed, it carried the story. In fact, even when the Times and Seasons carried the story of Joseph Smith, Joseph said that uh, he often wondered uh, which of all the churches were right, or were they all wrong together? So he says, I often wondered, were they all wrong? And then after he saw the two personages and was told that they were all wrong, there's a parenthesis that used to appear in there. It's not in the present edition. They've taken it out. But uh, it, it, it is in Joseph Smith's manuscript history because I've checked it myself. And it says at that point, where it never entered my mind that all the churches were wrong. He apparently had forgotten that earlier and said he'd often wondered whether all the churches were wrong. And so since there was a conflict there, the text had to be cleaned up a little in order to uh, remove that little bit of embarrassment. And that text was changed at that point, so it no longer reads like the original manuscript in the church historian's office. So I did mean, in reality, that the text was changed, but I meant more than that. And then the young man that was writing to me said, after he said, you certainly didn't mean the text was changed, because he'd never heard the text was changed. And he said, you certainly didn't mean the story was changed. Well, as a matter of fact, I meant that too. And uh, yet, I only had a little smidgen of knowledge about the difficulties at that time. At that time I wrote, in 1960, I knew that there was a mass confusion among the statements of the general authorities quoted throughout various volumes of the Journal of Discourses. And, uh, for example, while, Brig while Joseph Smith indicates the father and the son apparently both appeared to him, <laughs> Brigham Young has a statement about the same incident and says God did not appear to him at all but sent his angel. And quite frequently you'll find in the Journal of Discourses uh, the general authority saying an angel appeared to Joseph Smith in the woods at the age of 14. So uh, there was general confusion among the general authorities as to as to whether it was an angel, or whether it was a god, or whether it was the father and the son. But I was also aware at that time of another conflict. A conflict between this statement of Joseph Smith, which was essentially written around 1838 to 1839, in that period, and an earlier account that had been published in 1834 in Joseph Smith's own journal, his magazine, his periodical, known as the Messenger and Advocate, and written by Oliver Cowdery, who said he was going to give a true and full account of the origin of the church. And he claims that Brother Joseph is giving and supplying the information for this account. And the interesting thing about that account is that Oliver Cowdery describes exactly the same revival that took place that started with the Methodists and then became prevalent among all the denominations and uh, that segment of the country and involved the Methodist, Presbyterian, and Baptist ultimately. And that as a result of that excitement, Joseph had said that his mother, sister, and two brothers had joined the Presbyterian Church, and Calvary says exactly the same thing. And so one would expect, would you not, to find that Oliver Calvary said that that took place in 1820, like Joseph Smith said. But no, Oliver Cowdery dates that to 1823, and he says he was stirred up by this revival, and instead of going to the woods, he goes to his bedroom, and there he wants to find out whether a supreme being did exist or not. And I thought that was kind of passing strange, that uh, if he'd already had this magnificent vision with the same revival stirring him up in 1820, that um, he would immediately... <laughs> Three years later, have another revival stir him up and not even be sure a supreme being existed and go to his bedroom. So obviously something was out of kilter there. And that's what I meant, that I thought that the, that the story had been changed somehow or other. Well, 
It was this that led me to ask the question, well, you know, a revival just doesn't disappear from history without leaving some trace. And so I began to ask the question, how can we find out when this revival did occur? How can we get a handle on that? Are there any records? Well, I'd scarcely gotten started on trying to uh, find out about the revival when another account appeared for the first time, this strange account that some people have called it, or what is Joseph Smith's earliest account, written probably around 1832 or possibly as late as 1833, and written in his own hand, and instead of being motivated by a revival, he is motivated by his Bible reading. He tells us in this account that he had been reading the Bible since the age of 12, and he tells us that he had already concluded that all the churches were wrong. And then uh, he has a vision of Christ appear to him. Well, that didn't quite sound the same as what he was saying six years later when he says that he, he, he wondered which of all the churches were right, and the Lord himself, the Father, had to tell him that all churches were wrong. But more than that, the difference in motivation was quite evidently uh, uh, desperate uh, in the two accounts. One was reading the Bible. The other one was the revival. And so the picture became more confused. Well, what was to guide us out of these conflicting stories? Uh, the one historical reference point uh, in the official version was the matter of the 1826 revival, uh, the 1820 uh, revival. And so I set about trying to find out what we could discover about that revival. Now, the earlier of the two accounts, the one by Oliver Cowdery, which speaks of, this, of the same revival, mentions a Reverend Lane in connection with this. And so I tried to run down Reverend Lane. It just happened that at the time I decided to do this, a good Methodist friend of mine had invited me over to a town about 30 miles away to draw a truck picture for him. And afterwards we were chatting and I said, Ralph, Ralph how can I get a hold of, of a Methodist a minister's list uh, that uh, might give me an idea who this Reverend Lane was, the presiding elder? Ralph said, you know, I just picked up a book last week, printed in 1840, Bang, History of Methodism. And in the back it's got a list of all the Methodist preachers up to 1840 and when they were ordained. So we went to the back, and there were only about three lanes that were listed, and the most likely prospect seemed a fellow named George Lane, and when I got to leap into a book, I just happened to open and found out that George Lane had been laboring up in the Ontario district. Well, that was up in the area where Joseph Smith lived. So I said, I want to borrow this. I took it home, and I Xeroxed out the back, and I began to try to collect information on George Lane. I discovered that the Methodist minutes uh, of the... Uh, the annual minutes of the Methodist Church had a list of all the pastors every year for every area where what circuits they were assigned to or if they were a presiding elder where they were to preside that year. And I uh, found this that the Methodist College not more than 30 miles from my home. Old McKendry College was formed, founded by Bishop McKendry who lived back in Joseph Smith's lifetime, went to Illinois and founded the college and dumped a whole bunch of books out there and they've been there ever since. They had them locked up in the basement. Nobody had ever gone through them and they were full of an inch of dust, and I looked like a, I had changed my complexion by the time I came out of there. But the fellow said, that, there they are, look through them. Now, since they've discovered how valuable they are, they're all locked safely and cataloged in the circuit rider room, and you have to practically sign your life away to get rid of it, to get a look at them. But then, the fellow let me take home anything I wanted, even though I didn't have a library card there. So it was just an ideal time to wander along and to come upon uh, this material. Well, uh, I was able to uh, get the Methodist Conference minutes from there and uh, trace down uh, George Lane's activities. And I've made a, a copy of those minutes, and I'll leave them out there, and you can look them over, and you'll find that uh, George Lane, for example, in 1819, was assigned to the Susquehanna District. That's in central Pennsylvania, not in western New York. And you can trace it on through 1820. He was still in the Susquehanna District as a presiding elder, and you leap on through and finally, it's not until 1824 that he's assigned as presiding elder over the district up where Joseph Smith was, up near Palmyra, what was known as the Ontario district. Well, <clears throat> about this time also, as I was uh, flesh, fleshing out George Lane and getting to know him a little bit better, uh, I came upon another account 
of Joseph Smith's uh, uh, encounter with the Lord. And this one was written by William Smith. And he not only mentions Reverend Lane as having part in the revival, he places the, uh, the whole situation when Joseph was 18 years old. And he also mentions another gentleman named Reverend Stockton. And Stockton, he mentioned, was the one who preached Alvin's funeral. Alvin died late in 1823 in November. And so I got in touch with the Presbyterian Historical Society, since Stockton was the Presbyterian preacher, and uh, was able to flesh out some things on him and found out that while he had visited the area in 1823, late in the year, he was really a pastor at Skenado, some distance east, uh, and uh, over about 60 miles, 70 miles east of Palmyra, and that early in 1824, he was called to be the pastor of the Palmyra Presbyterian Church. So everyone that's mentioned in connection with this situation doesn't appear on the scene until 1824. It's William Smith that gives us the little piece of information that Stockton had preached Alvin's funeral and had suggested that Alvin had not gone to heaven because he had not been a member of the church. And therefore, uh, when this revival broke out, and the, uh, the mother and the uh, William Smith's mother and sister and two brothers were joining the Presbyterian Church, Joseph's father would have nothing to do with this because he was still rather carrying a little bit of a hurt feeling over what Reverend Stockton had said. Well, as I continue my uh, digging in that dusty old Methodist library, trying to find more and more information out about George Lane, uh, lo and behold, I, was, uh, I came upon the Methodist magazine. It took me a whole day to find all the volumes and put them all in sequential order. And then I started to read through. Well, it was about the end of the day, closing time, and I had read all the accounts of the revivals of religion since 1818 all the way up to 1824, and I found nothing about a revival in Palmyra. And I was just about to quit for the day when I happened to turn, pick off the 1825 volume, and I said, well, look at it, but it's too late. I'm sure it wouldn't be anything in there. And I come upon the article that says, Revival of the Religion on the Ontario District, a letter from the Reverend George Lane. And I almost fell off the chair. And just at that point, the librarian came down and said, I'm sorry, we're closing. You'll have to come back tomorrow. I put in a rather restless night <laughs> and uh, got up there first thing in the morning and read the article. And sure enough, it described the article, the, the revival, that occurred at Palmyra. In part, let me give you a little flavor of it. He said from the, he was a presiding elder, he wandered around from circuit to circuit holding quarterly meetings on each circuit, and he was over in the Catherine circuit, and he said, I went to the Ontario circuit, where the Lord had already begun a gracious work in Palmyra. This is a pleasant village situated on the uh, western canal, about uh, 22 miles east of Rochester, and is now a flur flourishing condition. In this place, the work commenced in the spring and progressed moderately until the time of the quarterly meeting which was held on the 25th and 26th of September. About that time, it appeared to break out afresh. Monday evening after the quarterly meeting, there were four converted, and on the following evening at prayer meeting at Dr. Chase's, there were seven. Among these was a young woman by the name of Lucy Spider. This young woman, like many of her age, had indulged in the vanities of a giddy world to the almost entire neglect of her precious soul. But now she was arrested in her mad course by the strong arm of conviction. The great uh, deep of her heart was broken up. She saw clearly that she was a child of wrath and in danger of hell. With this view of her sad condition, she fell prostrate at the feet of her uh, offending sovereign and in the bitterest anguish cried for mercy. In this situation, however, she was not suffered long to continue before she obtained the most salutary uh, satisfactory evidence of her acceptance with God brought to the merits of Jesus Christ. Her soul was unspeakably happy, and with great emphasis she exhorted others to come and share with her the ineffable blessing. From this time she appeared like Enoch to walk with God. Scarcely a cloud did arise to darken the sky or hide for a moment her Lord from her eye. In about a week after her conversion, she was married, according to a previous contract to Mr. Hiram Wilcox. Notwithstanding the pleasantry in which most people indulge on such occasions, all the solemnity with Lucy. Her time was employed in conversing on the great things of eternity and persuading others to embrace that religion which she had found so solid happiness in. 
Soon after she experienced religion, she took a violent cold, which no doubt laid the foundation of that disease which finally removed her to a world of, the, of spirit. The same week she was married, she was attacked by a bilious remittent uh, fever, uh, which terminated in a typhus fever. For some time she did not think herself, uh, think herself, or was she thought of by friends to be in much danger. But at length her disorder took such a turn as to convince her and others that her stay in this world would be but short. The patience with which she endured her afflictions, which were sometimes very severe, was remarkable. Not a murmur was heard from her lips. At times, though, uh, the violence of her disease, uh, through the violence of her disease, she was uh, partially deranged, though on religious subjects she was always rational and would immediately recognize any of her Christian friends. Religion, she observed, made a sick bed pleasant beyond anything she had ever anticipated. From Saturday night to the time of her dissolution, uh, which took place on Monday following, she seemed wholly swallowed up in God. Though extremely weak, she was almost incessantly employed in exhortations, prayers, and praise. At one time, while her friends were standing around her bed, she viewed them with great earnestness and said, Farewell, my friends, I bid you all farewell. After this, when the cold sweat had collected on her face and every moment was expected to see her last, she opened her eyes and began to sing with a low voice that seemed more than human. And so he gives this full description and then says, a little later on, that because she was about 19 years old, this greatly affected many people, and that one incident was what shook Palmyra loose and broke it loose for a fantastic revival. Well, after I found George Lane's child of the revival, it fitted every aspect of the description that was mentioned by Joseph Smith and Oliver Calgary both. Then I went a step further and I thought, well, what evidence do we have beyond this account of a revival? I discovered that the Talmire Baptist Church records were still in existence. And when I looked, lo and behold, here for 1824 was a list that ran all the way down Went over the next page, and this was the month of uh, October and November the 20th, November the 25th, a whole batch more taken in by profession. Here's December, all the way down here. Here's January. Here's some more in January. Here's February, and here's March. And uh, all the way down uh, to the end of March. When they were through, that a Baptist alone had baptized on profession of faith 95 people. And remember, Palmyra was a village at that time of something a little over a thousand inhabitants. The Presbyterians, likewise, had a fantastic revival. And while the Presbyterian local records were not uh, still in existence, the Presbytery records are still in the historical society in Philadelphia. And so I discovered that when you read the uh, minutes of the Presbytery, the Presbyterians, unlike Presbyterians today, fully expected every church every year to have a revival, and if not, why not? And so as a part of their presbytery meetings, they had a free discussion on the state of religion to find out why we're not doing so well. Well, under 1825, I found this interesting description. It says uh, that the... Uh, I'll put my hands on here a minute. The, um, in the congregation of Palmyra, uh, the Lord has appeared in his glory to build up Zion. Uh, more than a hundred have been hopefully brought into the kingdom of the Redeemer. You see, Presbyterians are always cautious. They are hopefully brought in. <laughs> they are prepared for backsliders, you see. So, uh, <laughs> here the Presbyterian Church wound up with, uh, when it all was, uh, thus was settled, with 99 who received by profession of faith in Christ. The Methodist Church records were also missing, but again, the annual conference minutes helps us out because while the individual churches are not listed, the, the circuits, which uh, then consisted of all small churches uh, on a given circuit, the total membership on those circuits were listed. And lo and behold, we find for, uh, for Palmyra, when the revival was over, that in 1824, for example, before the revival started, on the Ontario circuit, they listed 417 white members and one Negro member. And uh, uh, in the following year, when the count was in, they listed 627 white members and two 
Negro members. And so there is a gain of over 200 for the local Methodist church. When you add that up, that's 400 out of a village of a little over 1,000. That's a pretty good percentage. I think any preacher would settle for that kind of revival in his community, 40% uh, of the inhabitants. So no wonder uh, Joseph Smith could describe this in such glowing uh, terms as uh, having become uh, prevalent throughout all the whole area. Because as you look at the newspapers of the day, which also carried the accounts of the revival, you find that, the, that it spread from there to Manchester, to Sulphur Springs, over to Vienna, uh, over uh, directly uh, to the east, all the way over uh, to uh, Lyons, and uh, it had become general in that whole region of country, just as Joseph Smith had, uh, had said in his account. The only thing was that the earlier account by Oliver Cowdery, which placed the revival in 1823, was really closer to the 1824 date. It went from September 24 over into uh, 25. It was really closer than Joseph Smith's later account, which moved the revival back to 1820. Well, then someone told me that Lucy Smith's account had both revival stories in it. It had a revival that was implied in the 1824 period because she talks about wanting to join the church after Alvin's death and that also she had given Joseph Smith's account in 1820. So that raised the question in my mind, uh, were there two revivals? Was there a revival in 24 and 25 which perhaps uh, Joseph Smith confused with a revival in 1820? So we plowed back over the same ground again. And uh, we looked at the figures and the statistics. And what we found was that for the Baptist church, they only took in six by profession of faith the whole year. Presbyterians, who very carefully noted every opportunity of a revival of religion in their Presbyterian minutes, made no reference to a revival in Palmyre. But the Methodist church fared the worst of all. They lost members each year for 1819, they went down a little in 1820, a little more. 1821, they were down even a little lower. All these figures are up here, and you can look them. They'll be in the back. You can look at them later. <clears throat> but what was even more surprising was when I recently got an opportunity to look at Lucy Smith's preliminary draft for her book. Where, lo and behold, when I looked at her preliminary draft, I discovered that the 1820 version of the revival is not in her preliminary draft. Indeed, uh, she mentioned specifically a revival in 1824, which in the manuscript is X'd out, and in the final draft, left out completely, and in its place, an 1820 story of Joseph Smith has been added up further in the narrative. This is the way the deleted part of the preliminary draft reads. About this time, He's talking about right after Alvin's death. Uh, about this time, there was a great revival in religion, and the whole neighborhood was very much aroused to the subject, and we among the rest flocked to the meeting house to see if there was a word of comfort for us that might relieve our overcharged feelings because, of course, of Alvin's death. Then it continues, there was at this time a man then laboring in the place to effect the union of all churches, uh, that all denominations might be agreed to worship God with one mind and one heart. And this I thought looked right, and I tried to persuade my husband to join with them, as I wished to do so myself, and it was the inclination of them all, except Joseph. He refused them first to attend the meeting with us. He would say, Mother, I do not wish to prevent you from going to meeting or joining any church you like or any of the family who desire the like. Only do not ask me to do so, for I do not wish to go. But I will take my Bible and go out into the woods and learn more in two hours than you could if you were to go to meeting two years. My husband also declined attending the meetings after the first, but did not object to myself and such of the children as, choose, uh, as chose going or becoming church members, if, um, if, if we wished. Joseph also said, um, I do not... Um, uh, uh, said, I do... Uh, it will do you no harm... Uh, to join them, but you will not stay with them long, for you are mistaken in them and do not know them. And then he gave an example of how a certain deacon Jessup, who incidentally happened to be the elder at the Presbyterian Church, 
She said, you're going to get in with this kind of company, and he'd set, take a widow woman's last cow. And then she said that really happened about within a year's time, and that was the prophecy that her son made. So if she had joined the Presbyterian Church in 1820, it seems fancy strange that she would be thinking about joining a church where Deacon Jessup would be rubbing shoulders with her after Alvin's death, especially when she mentions the revival in 1824. But as I said, the reference to the revival has been deleted from Lucy's account. And so it seems that Lucy and William and uh, the earliest uh, account that was printed by uh, Oliver Cowdery, uh, plus the church records of the day, uh, plus George Blaine's own account, clearly indicates that the revival was 1824 and not 1820. Just to make certain, I spent hours and hours reading through the revival accounts of some two dozen newspapers, and I read every intelligence, religious intelligence report, and I found revivals of every little pinpointed podoc wherever they happened, but not a mention between January of 1819 through December of 1821 in any periodical that reported revivals of any revival in Palmyra. And let me say that they were so anxious to report revivals that, believe it or not, the Presbyterians rejoiced when the Baptists had a revival, and the Baptists rejoiced when the Presbyterians had one, and the Methodists rejoiced when either of them had one. They reported them across uh, the whole uh, denominational lines. It didn't make any difference. They were so happy to have a revival. And to think that in the light of that, nothing showed up for Palmyra. So I'm fairly convinced that at Palmyra there was no revival in the year 1820. I feel that Mormon scholars have recently come to that conclusion too, because they've tried to salvage Joseph Smith's uh, official version by sh shifting the scene of the revival. Now, you remember Joseph talked about in the place where we live, and in another account in an interview in 1844, he said it was in my neighborhood. I don't construe neighborhood as something that's 15 miles or 25 miles down the road. That's not my neighborhood, especially in horse and buggy days. But the Mormon scholars have, have shifted the scene of the revival down the road to the town of Vienna, some 15 miles from Joseph Smith. They've done this because they found a very, very late recollection, collect, recollections collected by a fellow by the name of Blakesley, who happened to be the Methodist pastor some 65 years later in the town of Vienna, which today, of course, is called the town of Phelps. And in interviewing a couple of old-timers, he found that sometime back in the 1820s, at a camp meeting on the Granger campground, there was indeed a cyclone of religion that swept across the countryside. The Vienna uh, church was on the Lions circuit, and because he noticed an increase of 300 members on the Lion circuit uh, from what was reported in the July figures, in July, you see the Methodist Conference met from July to July, so when you talk about the year 1820, you're talking about from July 1820 on. You're not talking about from January on. If you want to get from January, you have to get the year 1819, which gives you from July 1819 to July 1820. So he looked at the figures that had been reported for the period from July 1819 to July 1820 and reported at the 1820 conference. And they were down to about 370 members on the Lions circuit. Now, in July 1821, when the figures running from that conference year 1820, July 1820 to July 21, when those figures were reported in July 1821 for that year, they were up to 674. And so he saw an increase of 300 members, and that's where he put his little reminiscences. But he was incorrect in putting them there, because it so happened that in July of 1820, the very year when he thought there was this tremendous increase occurring, at that very moment, a fellow by the name of Abner Chase was appointed as presiding elder. Four years later, he retired from that job, because in the Methodist Church in those days, you could only be presiding elder for four years, and you had to move on to some other area. He handed in his final four-year report, and it was published, I have a copy of it here, in that same Methodist magazine. And in it, under the date of July 1st, 1824, he talked about how he first came onto the district, and he said for the first two or three years on that district, which included the Lions Circuit, we saw no great awakening. 
I personally would rather take the report of the man on the field than some fellow 65 years later trying to figure out when this cyclone occurred. And I think that what happened was that since the Lion Circuit was touched in late in 1823 and again fully in 1824 with a revival that also touched Palmyra, well, that was when you have to put the cyclone. And that's where it fits the best. But having found that little scrap of membership figures at jump of 300, uh, not noting that it had dropped 300 the previous year, and it might simply be a typographical error where the printer should have set 670 and set 370, uh, the Mormon scholars have jumped to that and said, ah, there was a revival in Vienna. Furthermore, they have coupled that statement with a statement that was made by Orson Miss Turner back in 1851, and Orson Miss Turner said that when, Jay, when he, was, he left, Orson was, lived and trained as a printer in Palmyra and left Palmyra about 1822. And he mentioned Joseph Smith and having known him, and he said in his writing and published work in 1851 that Joseph Smith caught a, a bar of Methodism way down in the campground on the Vienna Woods. Well, there's a campground, there's the name Vienna, and so you put this uh, campground uh, meeting experience together with that one, and you got Joseph at the campground down in Vienna getting a glorious revival and experience. However, as it turns out, if you would check the historians uh, of the area, you'll find that the Granger Campground was two miles east of uh, Vienna on the old state road, while the Vienna Road came from Palmyra up to Vienna and entered at the northwest corner. And when uh, Turner talks about the campground down on the Vienna Road, he's talking about the campground in Palmyra, not any campground down here. But Dr. Backman of BYU is so anxious to prove the case that he has conflated the two accounts and missed the fact that they are talking about two different things, rolled them into one piece of dough, and hammered out a revival, and says Victoria, victoriously, aha, we now have found there was a revival in 1820. However, if you think uh, all this is generally confusing, you haven't begun to be confused until you read Lucy Smith's preliminary uh, draft of her book. Because not only does she not have the first uh, vision story and the revival, which appears in the printed, final printed edition, but she has an entirely different reason for motivating Joseph Smith to have any encounter with an angel or God uh, that's different from either the account of Oliver Calvary or the account uh, of Joseph Smith himself. Either the strange account, which has him reading the Bible, or the account that has him preached uh, listening to a revival, uh, Lucy sets hers in what might be called the first Mormon family home evening. He said that, she said that uh, they were sitting around uh, discussing uh, things religious, and he said the subject uh, one evening, somewhere around in 1822 or thereabouts, he doesn't give it a date, but it's right before Alva dies. And uh, he said we were sitting till quite late, conversing upon the subject of the diversity of churches that had arisen up in the world, and the many thousand opinions in existence as to the truths contained in Scripture. Joseph, who never said many words upon any subject, but always seemed to reflect more deeply than common persons of his age on everything of a religious nature, after we ceased conversation, he went uh, to... Uh, Bed, and was pondering in his mind which of the churches were the true ones. But he had not lay there long until he saw a bright light enter the room where he lay. He looked up and saw an angel of the Lord standing by him. The angel spoke, I perceive that you are inquiring in your mind which is the true church. There is not a true church on earth, no, not one, and has not been since Peter took the keys of the Melchizedek priesthood after the order of God into the kingdom of heaven. The churches that are now upon the earth uh, are all man-made. But you cannot, uh, and then he says, there is a record for you, and Joseph, you cannot get it until you learn to keep the commandments. And then he goes on and tells them about the hill tomorrow and so on. So there is another one to choose from. You can pay your money, as the fellow says, and take your choice. Well, how can we weigh all of these opposing stories? I think one helpful approach is to look at Smith's development in his theological thinking 
and see how his 1838 story fits into this, and then I think we can find a key, a clue, to how we can come out in the matter of evaluating whether the 1838 story should be relied on and depended on, or whether it is some sort of later fabrication. If we look at the Book of Mormon, we find, interestingly enough, that in the Book of Mormon, the theology of that period of Smith's life, Joseph Smith has uh, adopted a theology for the Book of Mormon that is very close to what we know as Socinianism. Socinianism was popular in western New York. A young gentleman at the neck, in the next township, about 20, 25 miles away from Joseph Smith, named David Miller, who came there in 1817 and started a... Uh, a movement known as uh, the Christian Church Movement, usually hyphenated the word, Christians, and uh, who maintained that the name of the church would be only called by the name of Christ, and uh, had succeeded in getting churches established in Canandaigua, which is about 13 miles south of Palmyra, up at Williamson, New York, which is about 15 miles north of Palmyra, and uh, had a gentleman who was ministering even to some people in Palmyra by the name of Oliver True, uh, David Mellard mentions that uh, Socinianism was rampant in, the, in the, the area, and he himself tried to combat it. Socinianism teaches that there is only one God. He is so much one God that there is no distinction within him between the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. That these are simply modes of talking about God. When you talk about God up in heaven as a spirit, you call him Father. When you think about God incarnate on the earth, you call him the Son. When you think about God working inside the hearts and lives of men, you call him the Spirit. And so there is no real distinction. The Father is the Son, and the Son is the Father. Now listen to this passage in Mosiah. God himself shall come down among you, this is Mosiah 15, and shall redeem his people. And because he dwelleth in the flesh, he shall be called the Son of God having subjected the flesh to the will of the Father, being the Father and the Son. The Father, because he was conceived by the power of God. That is, uh, he had a part in making his own uh, human nature, and so that made him a father. And the Son, because of the flesh, because he had a human nature, thus becoming the Father and the Son. And they are one God, they and not two, yea, the very eternal Father of heaven and earth, and thus the flesh becoming subject to the Spirit, or the Son, to the Father, being one God. <laughs> and so, what you have in the Book of Mormon is that type of thinking. In Ether 3.14, just to give you another example, I am the Father and the Son. In 2 Nephi 11.7, if there be no Christ, there is no God. Oh, there's just one person. As you get rid of Christ, you got rid of the Spirit of God, because there's just one person, namely God. And the Father and the Son are just different modes of talking about him, whether you're talking about him as a spirit in heaven or as a flesh and uh, in, incarnate person on earth. Uh, this same thought appears in Joseph Smith's inspired revision of the Bible. Uh, the passage in Luke 10, 23 which uh, is the great uh, Trinitarian passage that says that no man, that the Son, uh, uh, no man knows the Son except the Father, and no man knows the Father except the Son, and that they mutually know each other, and, and no, they don't, no one else knows the, the, them this way except the one to whom the Son reveals it. Then you can get in on his knowledge of God in that way. Well, Joseph Smith changed that to read this way. No man knows that the Son is the Father, and the Father is the Son, except him to whom the Son will reveal it. But you see, the Son and the Father are one and the same, exactly identical. There's no difference. Uh, the Doctrine and Covenants, uh, 24, 18, has the same idea. The Holy Ghost bears record of the Father and the Son. Which Father, Son, and Holy Ghost is, not are, is... In that way. Well, Joseph Smith changed that to read this way. No man knows that the Son is the Father, and the Father is the Son, except him to whom the Son will reveal it. So you see, the Son and the Father are one and the same, exactly identical. There's no difference. Uh, the Doctrine and Covenants, uh, 24, 
18 has the same idea. The Holy Ghost bears record of the Father and the Son. Which Father, Son, and Holy Ghost is, not are, is one God, infinite, eternal, and without end. You add to that the fact that also the Book of Mormon stresses that God is a spirit in Alma 18, 26, and 28, and so it becomes very apparent soon to anyone that's willing to look at the subject that back in those days, Joseph Smith never conceived the idea of seeing two separate personages because you only saw one because there was just one personage. And in fact, the revelation in Doctrine and Covenants 84, given in September 1832, which speaks of the greater priesthood, uh, even goes so far as to say no man can see the face of God, even the Father, and live. So the, the furthest thing from Joseph's mind, even up till 1832, was that you would ever see the Father. It's only when we get to the lectures on faith in 1835 that you get a concept of two personages in the Godhead. Now, I'm sure today, if you ask any Mormon how many personages are in the Godhead, he would tell you three. Not so in 1836. <laughs> in the Lectures on Faith, which gave the name to the book Doctrines and Covenants, because it was the doctrine part, followed by the second part, the Covenants and Commandments, the doctrines of the church. It says in, in lecture 5, it talks about the, the Father and the Son. They are the Father and the Son. The Father being a personage of spirit. Let me see this now, body. Glory and power, possessing all perfection and fullness. The Son who is in the bosom of the Father, a personage of tabernacle. And in case you missed it there, there's a little catechism at the back. And what it says, what is the Father? He is a personage of of glory and of power. And then, down a little further, the Son, he is a personage of tabernacle. And then it asks, how many personages are there in the Godhead? And the answer is two, the Father and the Son. So it's not until the 1835-36 period that Joseph Smith has come to the idea that there are two personages. But still, the Father is a spirit, and the Son has a flesh and bone body of personages of tabernacle. It's not until uh, you get to the Nauvoo period, in the Doctrine of Covenants 1, 30, 22, for example, that Joseph Smith mentions two personages of the Father and the Son who now both have flesh and bone bodies. So, what can we say? That Joseph Smith, by his own pattern of thinking, in no way could have seen the Father and the Son according to the theology, the theological points, the theological uh, stance, the, the thoughts of his mind about God, his own understanding at that early period. Now, it bears every trace of having been written later on. Now, while visionary experiences were com the common order of the day back in the 1820s and even the 1830s in the Palmyre area, there is no way, so far as I can see, that the 1838 account can be a true record of any such experience or of anything that actually occurred. There was no revival as Joseph described it in 1820, and furthermore, no such idea of two gods or even two personages in the mind of Joseph Smith uh, as early as 1820. In my opinion, any prophet who treats historical or even personal matters in such a kind of cavalier manner so as to change things to suit their own purposes is hardly a prophet to be trusted and place confidence in. And so I would encourage everyone to uh, turn to the really great prophet, Jesus Christ, the one of whom Moses spoke, the one who can indeed, when we trust and have full confidence in him, pardon all our sins and gain us a place in God's eternal celestial kingdom forever with the Lord. Thank you very much for your attention, and uh, this completes my uh, address this evening.